Good evening, everybody. For the last two lectures of this course in virology, I want to tell you about two incidents which took place in the last few years with ha which have to do with viruses and which made it into the press big time. These were stories that were picked up by many, many newspapers, wire services, websites. There was a lot of controversy over both of them and they engaged a lot of the public. And after having taken this course, you should be able to understand all of the science behind these. And my idea of presenting these to you is to get you ready for the future when you're gone from this course and you see a story like one of these, you'll be able to interpret it on your own. I'm sure that you'll be able to do that. So the first story is called XMRV. And this story begins with trying to understand what causes prostate cancer. There are two kinds of prostate cancer. There's sporadic prostate cancer, and this is associated with an age-related increase in prevalence as you get older. There are more people with sporadic uh, prostate cancer. And then there is familial prostate cancer. That is, it has a genetic determinant. This has an early onset, uh, typically less than 55 years of age. Uh, a number of studies in the past few years have suggested that a mutation in the gene encoding RNA-L put people at increased risk for developing prostate cancer. Now you may remember that RNA cell is an interferon induced gene. It has antiviral activities. So when you're infected with a virus, it's sensed by the innate immune system and interferons are made and then interferons induce interferon stimulated genes of which RNA cell is one. And again, a particular variant R at amino acid 462 to glutamine appeared to, in certain people, lead to increased risk for prostate cancer. And the idea here is maybe this mutation, this amino acid change, this single amino acid change, decreases the catalytic activity of the enzyme, or which is an enzyme, of course, RNA cell. It chops up RNA. That's how it's an antiviral protein. Um, maybe it's anti-apoptotic. So normally, uh, this enzyme would drive apoptosis of tumor cells and if this mutation is present, it might let them grow, and that could allow the prostate cancer to grow. Or maybe this suggested that a virus was involved and that having this mutation led to decreased ability to fight the viral infection. So with that in mind, a group decided to ask if there were any viruses in prostate tumors. Pretty straightforward question. And they, The way they did it was to use what's called a DNA microarray. Now, a DNA microarray, uh, the main part of it are glass slides such, such as those shown here. And each of these little dots on the glass slide is actually a little bit of a DNA sequence, an oligonucleotide, in this case representing a virus. So you can, these are, these are placed on the, on the glass slides by ro robots. You can see here a number of 96 well plates, each with a different viral DNA sequence. And again, these are oligonucleotides. They're short sequences. Uh, the robot prints them on the glass slide. And then you can hybridize uh, the glass side with uh, material from where you might suspect there's a virus, in this case, prostate, a prostate tumor. So what you would do is you would extract RNA from the prostate tumor. Uh, you would copy it into DNA with reverse transcription. And in the process, you would use one of the triphosphate that is labeled with a fluorescent dye. It could be green or red. Uh, and then you hybridize that labeled cDNA to the DNA microarray. And you can imagine that if the material that you started with, the RNA from the tumor, if it contains viral sequences, they will hybridize to one or more of the spots on this uh, DNA chip. All right, and you can read these by uh, automated instruments and tell if there's any positive samples. Now, this particular illustration of a microarray is. Um, showing how you do it in a slightly different way. This is comparing uninfected and virus-infected cells, and you would make cDNA with two colored dyes, and then you could see uh, the difference in the two 
but we're not doing that here. We're simply hybridizing prostate tumor RNA, which is converted to DNA, to a DNA microarray, a DNA microarray that composed that is composed of viral sequences, and this is called the viral chip. It is a a slide just like the one I showed you in the previous slide, a glass slide covered with many many dots and in this viral chip at the time they had the most conserved sequences of about 950 viruses and they took RNA from tumor tissue prostate tumor tissue and these came from the Cleveland Clinic there were 19 samples from 19 different men uh, RNA was extracted was fluorescently labeled as it was converted to cDNA and then hybridized to this viral chip and here's what they found. So when you do these viral chips, you can display uh, all this. This dark bar on the left is the entire slide, if you will. And here are areas of the slide where the uh, the prostate tumor cDNA hybridized to viral sequences, and they're represented here as bands. They're not actually dots. You can see quite a few of them hybridized and showed up as bands and. Here are the, the patient samples on the bottom. They're called VP and uh, note VP62. It turns out that these were retroviral sequences. And in fact, um, when this was subjected to PCR for a specific gene of retrovirus, the GAG gene, which you may recall, you can see uh, these samples, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight samples in this gel had uh, a positive signal for the gag sequence. So eventually they uh, they found that there was a positive signal and it turns out that it was a gamma retrovirus and we'll talk about what that is in a moment. In 7 out of 11 tumors homozygous for this RNA cell variant. No positive signal in 3 tumors from heterozygotes and 1 uh, in the wild type in a wild type uh, background. A tumor from a person that had no mutation in RNA cell. So from this it looked like this RNA cell mutation was important for uh, maybe allowing this virus to infect the tumor. Who knows? So they cloned from one of these patients, VP62, uh, the full-length viral genome. And you can see it shown here. And it turns out it is a retrovirus, as I said. And it has a gag Paul and envelope genes, just like simple retroviruses do. Uh, remember, it has an R and U5 at one end and an U3 and R at the other end. If this were, a, this is a sequence, of course, of the viral RNA. If this were proviral DNA, it would have LTRs at either end. And comparison of uh, this sequence with other retroviruses showed that it was very close to retroviruses in mice in particular murine leukemia viruses and endogenous retroviruses of mice, that is those viruses that are present in mice uh, in the uh, germline as proviruses. So this was called XMRV and they had an isolate from two different patients, uh, VP42 and VP62. And these were slightly different. You can see these uh, these little uh, ripples here in the in the illustration mean that there are some sequence differences. So this suggested that the viruses were independent isolates because they had slightly different sequences. We'll come back to that very much later. So the sequence of this uh, new virus, which was called XMRV, is aligned here next to a variety of other uh, mouse retroviral sequences. You can see here the patient samples, three of them here. Uh, endogenous retroviruses on mice present on different chromosomes. Remember, these are integrated into the germline DNA. Uh, and these are quite similar, as you can see here. And they're also similar to other uh, murine retroviruses, but not so similar to feline, gibbon ape, and koala retroviruses. So it looked like this virus is somehow related to a virus from mice. Now they took sections of the prostate tumors and they hybridized them with a nucleic acid probe against this XMRV. And you can see in these darker panels here, the, the green dots are where the, um, the probe is hybridizing to the cells in the prostate tumor section. Uh, and this particular cell right here, which is positive, is the one on panel A with the arrow pointing to it. And there's another one in 
uh, panel B you can see here and another one in panel C. So scattered cells throughout the sections. These are stromal fibroblasts. This is not the tumor cell itself. But these are stromal fibroblasts that are next to the tumor. So it's kind of strange that there were retroviral sequences, XMRV sequences in the tumor, but not actually in the cancer cells themselves. They then also did a histochemistry analysis where they took sections of the tumors and incubated them with a monoclonal antibody against the GAG protein of a, a, re, a, a virus which is closely related to a variety of different mouse retroviruses. It's called spleen focus forming virus. And this antibody was known to react with lots of different mouse retrovirus strains. And you can see it's it's detecting protein in these prostate tumor samples. So the suggestion here is that the genome is in certain cells near the tumors and then and the viral proteins are there as well. So from this study the conclusions are that this re new retrovirus, XMRV, XMRV stands for xenotropic murine leukemia virus related virus because it is a, a xenotropic virus, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, related to other murine leukemia viruses. Um, no mouse sequences were detected in these prostate tumor samples by PCR for a cellular uh, gene. The infection appeared to be restricted to samples with this RNA cell genotype or we should say the the XMRV was detected in these samples. There were polymorphisms found in our XMRV from different patients suggesting independent infections. Uh, viral nucleic acids and antigens were detected in stromal fibroblasts. So this was the first example of maybe of human infection with xenotropic murine leukemia virus-like virus. So this was a novel virus not seen before. And here's the paper that came from this study. Identification of a novel gamma retrovirus in prostate tumors of patients homozygous for R462Q RNA cell variant. This came mainly from uh, a number of different laboratories. Um, Don Ganim, Bob Silverman, and Joe DeRisi. And this was published in March 2006. A couple of questions immediately arose First of all, there's no oncogene in XMRV. We could tell that by sequencing the genome. The genome is, so if there's no oncogene, how would it transform cells? First of all, there are other ways, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be by an oncogenic mechanism carrying an oncogene. It was strange that the genome was found in stromal cells and not the carcinoma cells themselves. And remember, these data don't prove the link of the virus with prostate cancer. They just show that there is association. And one of the first questions that was asked is, what is the source of this virus? How did these people get XMRV in their prostate tumors? So let's refresh ourselves uh, with retroviruses. The family Retroviridae uh, has a number of genera in it. We have talked about uh, lentiviruses, HIV 1 and 2. We've talked briefly about Delta retroviruses, HTLV 1, 2, and 3. And here are the gamma retroviruses. These are rather simple looking retroviruses, enveloped of course with glycoproteins in the envelope uh, and two pieces of uh, two RNA genomes of pl positive polarity inside along with reverse transcriptase uh, and integrase. Uh, eventually the virus was recovered from cultured cells by transfecting them with a complete DNA copy of the viral genome which was constructed from the sequences obtained from the prostate tumor. And this is an electron micrograph of these virus particles. They look like typo, typical uh, murine retroviruses. So what are gamma retroviruses? We really haven't talked about them at all in this course. They are simple retroviruses, as I've said. They have only gag pollen envelope genes. And that's in contrast to the complex retroviruses like HIV that have a lot of other genes as well. These gamma retroviruses are widespread in nature. They infect a number of different mammals. The koala retrovirus, for example, is a gamma retrovirus, and birds and reptiles as well. They can be spread among animals as exogenous viruses, but they can also enter the germline. The provirus can be in the germline of animals and be spread as what we call endogenous viruses. They are commonly transmitted by vertical transmission, that is from mother to offspring, and they can initiate 
uh, viremia in the offspring when they arrive this way. And in, in the animals where they're present, they cause a variety of diseases like leukemias, cancers, neurological degeneration, and immunodeficiency. And these viruses in general cause cancers by insertional activation of a proto-oncogene. If you remember our transformation lecture, we talked about how some retroviruses pick up an oncogene, others insert next to an oncogene and turn it on, and that's what these do. And infection with these viruses in animals is lifelong. There are four kinds of endogenous murine leukemia viruses. These are retroviruses integrated into the germline of mice. There are what are called ecotropic retroviruses, these are only able to infect mice. So the mice have the provirus in them. Here's just a diagram of the provirus with the two LTRs. This would be integrated into the germline of these animals. Uh, ecotropic viruses only infect mice. Xenotropic viruses cannot infect the mice. They infect other species and that is what XMRV, it's a xenotropic virus. The mice that produce it or that produce related viruses, because you know, as far as we know, XMRV isn't in mice as yet in this story. Uh, it doesn't infect the mice. Uh, polytropic viruses infect most species. So that's what xenotropic means. It doesn't infect the mouse that produces it. Xenotropic uh, murine leukemia viruses were discovered in the 1970s from a certain strain of mice. Uh, and it was found that these viruses, strangely enough, could replicate in rat or human cells, but not in mice, hence Xeno, xenotropic virus. They're inherited as proviruses in all inbred mice. There are 10 to 20 copies in the genome of these mice. The receptor for the virus is a protein called XPR1. And interestingly, the mouse gene is mutated, so it can't be used as a receptor. That's why these mice cannot be infected by xenotropic viruses. Apparently during their evolution uh, the mouse gene mutated and now they can't be infected any longer. But other XPR1 genes, rats and humans, can bind the virus and that's why those species are permissive. Uh, the viruses are produced at very low levels in mice because the viruses can't spread in mouse cells. They're just produced from those cells that have a provirus the proviruses transcribe those cells make particles particles then can't infect any other cells so very few particles per mouse however it's been found many years ago that if you put human cells in a mouse which you often do to study tumors you inject them the cells in a mouse and they can take and grow in the mice and then you can take them out and pass them this almost always rescues xenotropic viruses from the mouse genome so these viruses, again, are produced in small numbers by the mice. They can't infect the mice, but if you stick human cells into the mice, those viruses will infect the human cells and make a lot of other viruses because they replicate really well in the human cells. And in the early days, this was thought when they put human cells into a particular mouse strain, they thought they were finding a new human retrovirus associated with tumors because the cells the human cells they were putting in these mice were tumor cells it turned out not to be true it turned out to be the virus being recovered from the mouse the xenotropic uh, murine retrovirus and so these were called rumor viruses so where did xmrv come from so these again this xmrv is highly related to xenotropic murine leukemia viruses which we've just finished talking about. So the implication is it's a fairly recent cross-species transfer from mice, so a zoonotic infection from mice to people. So if that's true, an interesting question is, do you find this virus in any lab mice? What was done was to develop a PCR probe to, to detect specifically XMRV, and this was used to do PCR on DNA from many, many different mouse strains. And as I said before, inbred mice contain about 10 or 20 xenotropic proviruses. These are xenotropic murine leukemia viruses. They're related to XMRV, but they are not XMRV. None of the 28 inbred strains or 
the 17 wild mouse species that they looked at contain a single provirus with the exact sequences of XMRV. So the conclusion was none of these murine viruses look like they're the immediate source. So maybe what happened is there was a single cross-species transmission event from a mouse to a human. Uh, the virus adapted to humans and it evolved and became different and then spread among humans. Um, and it could be that there is a provirus um, in areas where the, the first outbreaks in mice, in areas where the first uh, infections from mice to people happened. There are many questions raised by this. Uh, why the virus would go to the prostate, for example, is not clear. So the previous slide, which is out of order, uh, summarizes this relationship of XMRV to endogenous murine leukemia viruses. These are the endogenous xenotropic murine leukemia viruses. Um, here, here's a phylogenetic tree to emphasize this again. Um, the prostate cancer samples are shown here, and you can see they're highly related to uh, xenotropic proviruses found in mice. So the idea here is that many years ago, uh, mice were passing an exogenous murine leukemia virus among them. Eventually it became endogenized, that is it entered the germline uh, of these animals and it was passed efficiently from parents to offspring. Uh, and then the mice underwent a receptor mutation. The, muta the receptor for the virus mutated or a mutation was selected to make the mice resistant to the effects of the virus. Uh, and now uh, these, vi these mice are still endogenized with uh, xenotropic murine leukemia virus DNAs. They make small part quantities of the virus, but those cannot infect other mice. They don't pass exogenously from mouse to mouse, as did the original uh, murine leukemia virus. But the idea is that at some point, these viruses went from a mouse to a human, and possibly then from another from a human to another one, and maybe there were multiple uh, examples of primary infections and spread. That's the theory anyway. Now, as you remember, when retroviruses replicate, they produce a DNA copy of the genome flanked by LTRs, and this integrates into host cell DNA. It's an obligatory step in the replication cycle of these viruses, as you know. It has to happen. And the integration results in loss of some viral sequence at either end and the duplication of the host target sequence. And this is now, of course, the provirus. And the provirus is transcribed by host Paul 2 to make the viral RNA genome. What one group then did was to ask, are there any integration sites for XMRV in prostate tumor DNA? If, in fact, this virus is infecting the prostate and causing a tumor to arise, it should have integrated its DNA into the, G the DNA of the, the host cells. It's because, as I've said, it's an obligatory part of viral replication. So in this study, uh, published in October 2008, it's called Integration Site Preference of Xenotropic Murine Leukemia Virus Related Virus, a new human retrovirus associated with prostate cancer. What they did is they cloned out 14 integration sites from nine patient tumors and they could sequence these and see what genes were next to where XMRV had integrated and they found there's no integration near oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. So it was kind of strange that these are there's no oncogene in this virus and they're not integrating next to an oncogene. So third possibility is of course that they produce transactivating proteins that transform the cells. But the examination of the genome sequence didn't reveal any such proteins. So this was a puzzle. Nevertheless, they did identify integration sites. Here are some on three different uh, human chromosomes. Uh, you can see here is a, a schematic of how XMRV has integrated next to this particular gene called CREB5. And if you sequence the junction of XMRV with human DNA, you can identify where the virus ends, the end of the U5, and human genomic DNA. And you can do that for all of these three integration sites. Here's a, a gene called NFATC3, and XMRV is integrated right into it. And it's also integrated into another gene here. Uh, right away, many labs began to ask, what is the prevalence of this virus in prostate cancer? And laboratories all over the world got involved with this. Here's one from Germany, uh, and they looked in sporadic prostate cancer, 
and they found XMRV by PCR in just one out of 105 tissue samples from non-familial, that is spor sporadic prostate cancer. But they also found it in one out of 70 tissue samples from men without prostate cancer. So this was very rare and didn't suggest that this virus would be causing prostate cancer. And it was very strange that it was also present in control samples as well. Here's another study uh, from New York in Salt Lake City. XMRV is present in malignant prostatic epithelium and is associated with prostate cancer, especially high-grade tumors. So in this study, they analyzed 233 prostate tumor sections and 101 benign controls. They found XMRV DNA in 14 of the tumors, 6.2%, and in two of the controls, 2%. So again, we're finding the DNA in controls. They found protein in 23% of the tumors and 4% of the, of the controls. They made an antibody to the virus and used that to stain the tissues, and that's how they got these numbers. And they found in this study that the staining is predominantly in the malignant cells in the tumor, not in the uh, stromal fibroblasts as found in the previous study, but in the actual tumor cells themselves. So this, may, this study uh, was very interesting. It suggested that, in fact, there was a real association between this uh, XMRV and prostate cancer, although we still had this positivity in the controls, which was puzzling. Here's just an example of one of the uh, stains that they did. This is a section of one of the prostate tumors, and uh, it's hybridized with an antibody, and the brown staining shows where the antibody is binding. And you can see these brown cells here in the center. This is the malignant glandular epithelium. These are the tumor cells that are staining for uh, viral XMRV, viral antigen. Here's another study uh, from Germany. Lack of evidence for xenotropic murine leukemia virus related virus in German prostate cancer patients. They looked at 589 prostate tumor samples and 146 serum samples from prostate tumor patients. No uh, XMRV nucleic acid or antibodies were detected by ELISA. And eventually there were many, many other studies done and they're all summarized on this chart and the number of uh, cases that were looked at, prostate cancer cases you can see here, looked at the percent that were positive um, and when they had controls, the percent positive in the controls. And So you can see in the original study 10.5% positive, 1% uh, one per one positive here, 6.2, but always some positivity or often positivity in the controls. Some studies didn't find any. Some found some and some found none, but strikingly often some in the controls as well. So not a consistent picture of the involvement of this one virus in prostate cancer. You would have to say that if it were involved at all, it would not have to be the only agent that was causing the tumor. While this work was going on, uh, the laboratory of Dusty Miller made a very interesting finding, and they published it in this paper in July 2009. It's called Multiple Integrated Copies and High-Level Production of the Human Retrovirus XMRV from 22RV1 prostate carcinoma cells. So this is a cell line. It's called 22RV1. It's made from a prostate tumor. And they found that this prostate cancer cell line made XMRV. The way the cell line is made was to take a human prostate tumor and inject it into nude mice. And nude mice don't have an immune system, and so they won't reject the tumor. And they provide a nice environment for the tumor to grow. It will grow to a substantial size in the mice. You can then take it out and pass it to another mouse. And eventually, you can then place it in culture, and it will grow. It will have obtained the ability to grow in culture. So this cell line, made in this way, produced a virus that had a sequence nearly identical to XMRV from prostate tumors. So they say uh, that 22RV1 virus is XMRV and not a mouse xenotropic virus acquired during passage of the cells in culture or in mice. And that is because this virus was nearly identical to the sequence of the virus from prostate tumors.
Now, the second part of this story has to do with chronic fatigue syndrome. And in October of 2009, this paper was published in Science. Lombardi, Ruschetti, uh, a number of other authors, Silverman, who was on the original XMRV isolation paper from prostate tumors and Judy Mikovits. Detection of an infectious retrovirus XMRV in blood cells of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. So chronic fatigue syndrome goes by the name CFS, chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, uh, myalgic encephalitis, and a variety of other names. It has an unknown etiology. The estimates are that 17 million people in the world have it. And there isn't a laboratory test that you can use to detect this disease or diagnose it. You have to apply a variety of, of criteria which uh, are used to then decide if the patient has the disease or not. And what is it? It is se severe incapacitating fatigue that is not improved by bed rest. Uh, the symptoms have to last for at least six months. You have to have difficulty sleeping. Problem with concentration, short-term memory, joint pain, muscle pain, tender lymph nodes, sore throat, headache are some of the symptoms. Uh, in particular, post-exertional malaise, when you exercise, you get very tired afterwards. A quarter of the patients with this disease are fully disabled, and there are also patterns of relapse and remission. You get better and you get worse, you get better and you get worse. Uh, in these patients, there also appears to be a chronic low-grade Im immune upregulation. They, they appear to be responding. Uh, their immune system is responding continuously. Their NK cells don't function well. There are CNS uh, abnormalities. Um, there are problems with energy, metabolism, genes. And they seem to have more frequent and latent infection with herpes viruses like EBV, HHV6, and cytomegaloviruses, as well as enteroviruses and other microbes. And maybe these actually trigger the disease. Maybe more than one microbe uh, triggers it. So in this study, what they did is they took uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from patients with CFS, and they did PCR looking for XMRV. And remember, XMRV had already been published as being present in prostate tumors, so this group, group picked up on it, and they did PCR. And here you have CFS patients with various numbers, and you can see some of them are positive for the GAG, the envelope, uh, sequences of this retrovirus is by PCR, but you also see there's some positivity in the normal controls. So in the diseased individuals, CFS patients, 67%, and the controls, 3.7%. Uh, this, the virus that was present in these patients was sequenced, and you can see it's right up here, WPI are the CFS samples, and they're compared to the VPs, which are the samples, the XMRV from prostate tumors. And you can see they cluster in this phylogenetic tree, 100% identity. And again, these are all XMRV, uh, and they're highly related to xenotropic murine leukemia viruses of mice. Uh, here's some evidence that, in fact, these patient cells are infected with virus. Um, here is a, a, a flow cytometry profile using antibodies uh, against murine leukemia virus, which will detect this XMRV. Uh, you can see one patient sam blood sample uh, is positive, another is positive, another here. In fact, all five of these are positive. And the normal uh, peripheral blood cells from a, a, a healthy individual do not have um, proteins related to XMRV. And all these other panels here basically are looking for viral proteins. Here's a Western blot using antibodies to spleen focus forming virus, which we uh, remember we used before in the prostate tumor sections. Uh, and these are detecting proteins in patient blood uh, related to XMRV. And you can see the same here. These are more patient samples. Uh, and the suggestion on the bottom is that T cells and B cells also have uh, viral proteins in them. These are flow cytometry plots using antibodies to, against murine leukemia virus. Uh, here's, here's again more Western blots showing retroviral proteins in patient samples 1104, 1150, 1221, but not in normal uh, patient samples. Uh, in some of these uh, individuals, they were able to culture the virus from the patient 
uh, lymphocytes in, in culture by adding other cells. And you can see the, the typical retrovirus present there, suggesting that at least in some of them there's infectious virus present. And finally, some of these sera contain antibodies that react with uh, cells that are expressing uh, related retroviral antigens. So these are flow cytometry plots where we have a cell line that's expressing a an envelope glycoprotein of a related retrovirus uh, and then patients here are used to stain those cells and you can see normal plasma does not stain but here plasma from one of the patients WPI1104 is reacting with uh, these cells. So the suggestion here is that these patients here contain antibodies but these reagents are not XMRV. The cells that are used here are not producing XMRV. They're producing related um, envelope, spleen focus forming virus envelope. So it's not clear if this is actually specific for XMRV or not. So to summarize this information, an association has been made between XMRV and CFS just as an association was made between prostate cancer and XMRV. So the question is, is XMRV the cause of CFS or is it a passenger? Does it just happen to be there? In CFS there's no correlation with the RNA cell genotype. And perhaps the most troubling aspect of this story is that the virus is present in 3.7 percent of healthy blood donors, which makes several million people in the US. That's a problem. So this was picked up by the press, the New York Times. Two articles here, one by Denise Grady, viruses found in many with chronic fatigue syndrome. Many people with CFS are infected with a little known virus that may cause or at least contribute to their illness, researchers are reporting. And here's the, the science uh, paper results. Another article down here by Dave Tuller in January 2011. Chronic fatigue syndrome causes a host of debilitating symptoms, but what causes the syndrome itself? So more studies were done by others. This one from Harvey Alter's lab. Detection of MLV-related virus gene sequences in blood of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and healthy blood donors. They found MLV murine leukemia virus-like sequences in 32 out of 37 CFS patients and some healthy controls. And some of these were had paired samples tested 15 years apart, which would suggest that the virus was present all that time. These sequences were not really related to the xenotropic viruses, but more closely to polytropic murine leukemia viruses, that is, um, murine retroviruses that can infect a lot of different animals. And here there was more sequence diversity than XMRV in this particular study. So here's a summary of some of the studies looking for XMRV and chronic fatigue syndrome. There are two so far where they have found it. Lombardi et al., which is the science paper, and Lowe et al., which we just discussed. And then there are a number of studies finding little or no XMRV in CFS patients in the UK, USA, China, Germany, uh, USA again, UK again, Japan again. PCR negative, serology negative in some cases. So just like the prostate cancer story, it was not looking good. Now the accusations began flying. The people who had detected the virus in CFS patients said to the others, you don't know how to do your assays properly. And this became a very, very messy situation. Uh, this paper was published in PLOS One in April of 2010, which said that a <laughs> an, in, an inhibitor of retroviruses, raltegravir, which is in fact an integrase inhibitor, it's used to treat AIDS patients, also inhibits XMRV. It inhibits its replication in culture. Uh, and they also looked at other antiviral drugs that were used for, for uh, retroviruses. Uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors worked. And integration inhibitors, well, Tegravir and another one. Now, this was picked up by the patient community, which is quite large in the U.S. and quite vocal, being frustrated that there has not been a cure for this disease for many years. And some of these individuals began to seek physicians who would treat them with these antiretrovirals. And this really started 
a very sordid part of the history of this virus because it's not really clear that the virus is causing the disease, yet people were so frustrated that they tried to find people who would treat them with these anti-HIV drugs. And uh, again, this got quite nasty on the Internet. Then a series of paper came out that suggested that something was really amiss here. And this first one, published in February 2011 from Myra McClure and John Coffin, mouse DNA contamination in human tissue tested for XMRV. Uh, a study in the UK was done, which was done in the, as part of this study, found XMRV by PCR in 4.8% of prostate cancers, but all of these positive samples were also positive for mouse DNA. In other words, they were contaminated with mouse DNA. And 21% of the negative samples were also positive for mouse DNA. The implication is that mouse DNA is everywhere. Somehow it's getting into these tumor samples and contaminating them and making it look like they are XMRV positive. Here's another story out of Japan which showed that a commercial PCR kit is contaminated with mouse DNA. So when you look for XMRV, you use PCR, and you typically buy a kit which is sold by a company, and this particular company's kit was contaminated with mouse DNA, and that's why they were getting positive signals for XMRV. They were just amplifying the endogenous murine xenotropic viruses. Another study uh, from John Coffin and Brigitte Huber, contamination of human DNA samples with mouse DNA can lead to false detection of XMRV-like sequences. All these papers came out one after another. They tested DNA from peripheral blood of 112 CFS patients, 36 healthy controls. The few positive samples, the few XMRV positive samples, also contain mouse DNA. And John Coffin, one of the authors on this study, uh, made the analogy that PCR can detect XMRV if one drop of mouse blood is added to a swimming pool and then you took out a mill of water and did PCR on it. You could find the XMRV related sequences in the mouse. Remember, XMRV is highly related to xenotropic murine leukemia viruses found in mice. So if you contaminate your sample with mouse DNA, it's going to look like it has XMRV in it. And John Coffin began to give talks and he said mice are everywhere and he showed pictures of laboratories where at night the mice would crawl over the benches and he said who knows what chemicals they're getting into and contaminating them with their DNA and he made a very interesting movie which you should check out uh, he, uh, he he gave a talk at a, at a meeting and he said this is why I don't sleep well at night because I think all this is mouse DNA contamination uh, another paper in the same series from Greg Towers, disease-associated XMRV sequences are consistent with laboratory contamination. He also found that mouse DNA can contaminate patient samples. He found that the genetic variation in the XMRV recovered from this cell line, 22RV1, exceeds that of all the human XMRV isolates. So this is a cell line growing in the lab, which we said before makes XMRV. He sequenced a bunch of isolates and got more variation in the sequence than all the human isolates. He said, this is not infection, this is contamination, a single source contamination, probably mouse DNA. Greg Towers also went back and looked at the studies of XMRV integration sites from human prostate cancer tissues that we talked about before, and he concluded that these are all contamination rather than genuine human infection. He looked at the sequences of the integration sites which were published and he said two out of the 14 patient-derived integration sites were identical to sites cloned in the same lab from infected prostate cancer cells. So in, in this lab they had infected a prostate cancer cell line with XMRV and they had identified and cloned out and sequenced the integration sites and those sequences were identical to the patient-derived integration sites, the prostate cancer DNA integration sites with XMRV in it. The implication is, is that they just contaminated the prostate tumor samples with these, the DNA from these infected cells. You never see identical ret retroviral integration sites in, in different studies. So uh, they think that 
these patient-derived sites that they reported, the integration sites, which were originally pretty powerful. It looked like this was real because that's how retroviruses replicate. He said they're all contamination. So that data is all wrong. Ela Singh, who had published a confirmation of the presence of XMRV in prostate cancers, then published a paper saying there is no XMRV in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. She did a large study with a large number of patients and found no evidence for um, XMRV in these individuals. And here's the paper published. Now, I wrote a blog post on this on the May 4th, 2011. And I've kind of given you a hint that this was a contentious issue. Again, there are lots of patients out there who want a cure for CFS, and they're very active on blogs and discussion groups, email, etc. Look at how many comments were on this blog post. This is the most I've ever had for one blog post. Most of them are arguing with this result, saying it can't be true, it's a cover-up, it's a conspiracy. You might want to go and check it out just to see the kind of fervor that was generated by this whole situation. These individuals who were sick wanted to know the cause of their disease and they were in some ways willing to overlook what turns out to be not so good science in order to to help them. Finally a paper came out in Science in 2011. The title was Recombinant Origin of the Retrovirus XMRV uh, here are the authors, and you can see on this paper John Coffin is one of them who had been very vocally insisting that you better be careful about contamination with mouse DNA. Now what is shown here is the history of uh, some cell lines that were produced by passage of a prostate tumor, a human prostate tumor in nude mice. And as I pointed out earlier, the way you make a cell line from such prostate tumors or any other tumors, in fact, is you inject them into nude mice. Here's a nude mouse. It has no hair, but it also has no immune system. And when you put these prostate cancer cells in, this is called a xenograft. You're putting it into a different species. The tumor will grow in the mouse. You can then take it out and pass it from mouse to mouse. And at some point, you can get it to grow in culture. And a cell line called 22RV1, remember that? That makes XMRV. That was made by passing a human prostate cancer xenograft called CWR22, Case Western Reserve 22, in nude mice. These investigators got samples of the original xenograft. And they figured out what nude mouse strain was being used. They got some of the early passages of uh, the tumor in mice. They got some late xenografts. And then, of course, they had the two cell lines produced uh, at the end, which turned out to produce XMRV. Now, it was only late in the game that anyone figured out that these cell lines made virus. So these cell lines were established in 1999 and it wasn't until a few years after XMRV was discovered in 2006 that people discovered that these cells were making virus. So imagine these cells are present in laboratories for many years and no one knows they're infected. Can you imagine how much contamination can result from that? Just, just keep that in your head. So what these individuals found was that the nude mouse, in fact, contains two partial proviruses, two integrated copies of XMRV, which they called XMRV1 and XMRV2. Neither one is a complete form of XMRV. One is half and the other is the other half. The early xenografts have pre-XMRV1 and 2, but the late xenografts have those two plus they have. These are XMRV positive. They make virus. And then the cell lines have make XMRV as well. So the implication is that XMRV sequences existed in this nude mouse originally as two proviruses, both of which were defective. By putting human cells into the nude mouse, we then rescued these two defective proviruses. They recombined and made XMRV. So by passage of human cells in the nude mice, we produced XMRV. That XMRV was then produced by the prostate tumor cell line and eventually somehow made its way contaminated samples of all sorts. They contaminated the prostate tumor samples and they contaminated the chronic fatigue syndrome samples. So here's 
a diagram which shows you pre-XMRV1 and pre-XMRV2. So these are two proviruses that are present in the nude mice. Neither one makes XMRV. Neither one is, is they're both defective. The green parts are the parts that are homologous to XMRV as identified in the prostate cancer and the CFS studies. These two proviruses were combined from here to here to here to here and here. So several crossovers to form a virus which is virtually identical in sequence to XMRV. So that's all the green sequences. So again, these two are present in nude mice. They don't make virus, but when you start passing human cells through them, you rescue an infectious virus out of this, which is basically XMRV. So XMRV is a virus made in mice in the laboratory by passing human cells through it. So it's not likely that this virus could cause human disease, and soon the studies came out to prove that. The first uh, published in Science, Failure to Confirm XMRV in the Blood of Patients with Chronic Fatigue Syndrome. This was a collaboration between many labs, uh, many of which were on the original science paper, uh, Judy Mikovits, um, and um, the Alter Group, which published the second paper. You can see John Coffin here as well. Frank Ruschetti was on the original science paper. Uh, and here the concern was, this was run by the Blood XMRV Scientific Research Working Group, concern was that this virus might contaminate the blood supply. So they did a very careful study where they got uh, replicate samples of blood of people from the previous study that were reported to be positive as well as 15 healthy donors. They distributed them in blinded fashion to nine labs and they performed assays, whatever they wanted to do. And only two labs reported evidence of XMRV. However, replicate samples showed disagreement and reactivity was similar among subjects and negative controls. So these results indicate that assays do not reproducibly detect XMRV and blood donor screening is not warranted. Another paper from Jay Levy, no evidence of murine-like gamma retroviruses in CFS patients previously identified as XMRV infected. Uh, he got uh, in, this, in this study, they obtained blood samples from 61 patients with CFS, 43 of whom had been previously identified as XMRV positive. They did PCR. No evidence of XMRV or any other MLVs in these blood samples. So uh, no, no linkage between uh, XMRV and CFS, likely attributable to laboratory contamination. Uh, then the retractions began. Our October report, Detection of an Infectious Retrovirus in Blood Patients of Cells with CFS. Two of the co-authors analyzed DNA samples. Uh, a re-examination of the samples they used shows that some of the cell DNA preparations are contaminated with XMRV plasma DNA. So they retract part of the paper that has the results from these experiments. And what was left was really not much of a paper at all. It should have been completely retracted, but it wasn't yet at this point. Here is a retraction by science, a full retraction of the CFS XMRV paper. Science is fully retracting the report detection of an infectious retrovirus in blood cells of patients with CFS. And the reasons are that multiple labs have failed to do this. The authors wouldn't um, retract the paper fully themselves, so the editor-in-chief of the journal did it himself. And this, of course, was reported in the New York Times. Here's an article by Dave Tuller in December 2011. Fatigue syndrome study is retracted by the journal. Here's a retraction of the low alter paper, the PNS paper showing detection of MLV related virus gene sequences in blood patients and they basically say we couldn't repeat these results uh, and um, we think it's, it's, it's not right so we're retracting it. While those retractions were going on um, something more sordid was happening. It turned out that one of the figures in the original science paper linking XMRV with CFS had been uh, altered. So in the original science paper, uh, this Western blot was shown indicating that patient uh, PBMCs had proteins that reacted on a Western blot with antibodies to uh, a murine leukemia virus. However, it turns out uh, that these um, lanes were not what they were, were supposed to be in the science paper. These are supposedly patient samples here, but in another panel presented at a scientific meeting, 
Uh, you can see the same pattern of reactivity here. Uh, and these are actually different patient numbers and they're treated with 5 azacytidine, uh, which is one way you can get retroviruses to replicate. Uh, and here's the original Western blot, which was pulled out of the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and you can see that the science paper labeling is different. So there was something funny going on here. There was clearly alteration of data. Um, and in the midst of this disagreement, one of the researchers on that science paper, Judy Mikovits, was fired uh, from her job at uh, the institute where she worked. And this was reported in the Chicago Tribune, discredited chronic fatigue researcher in California jail. Two years ago, researcher Judy Mikovits was riding high atop a wave of promise. In a stunning twist, Mikovits was arrested Friday and spent five days in a California jail cell. So she was since released. Uh, and Ian Lipkin did what now looks like a very smart thing. He got all of these investigators together and did a blinded analysis and said, we're going to give you uh, samples from patients who have CFS. It's going to be a rigorously characterized, geographically diverse population of patients, 147, 146 healthy subjects. They gave to the Mikovits group, Ruschetti, uh, Low, and Alter. Uh, they gave them all of the samples and said, you do assays that you want and see if you can find XMRV. And none of the laboratories was able to find XMRV or polytropic murine leukemia virus in any of the CFS samples. And I did a podcast on This Week in Virology with Ian Lipkin, and we called it a paradigm for pathogen de-discovery. You might want to listen to it. Ian talks about how he set up this blinded analysis, and he said, you know, when people do things you don't believe, you can't tell them simply they're wrong. You have to engage them and get them to participate and do the experiment. And that turned out to be very smart, because he got all these people to say, you're right, there's nothing there, and it's all laboratory contamination. And perhaps to end this story, uh, not too long ago, September 2012, in PLOS One, this paper was published, in-depth investigation of archival and prospectively collected samples reveals no evidence for XMRV infection in prostate cancer. So here we have a lot of the authors from the original paper finding XMRV in prostate tumors, Ganim, Durisi, uh, Silverman. And what they found here no XMRV in 39 newly collected prostate cancer tissues or in the samples from the original 2006 study. They were able to identify the original prostate tumor samples. They found no XMRV in it. So the archival tissue from this particular patient, VP62, which was used to construct the first XMRV genome, was XMRV negative, but the RNA, which had been extracted from this tumor a long time ago for that original study, that RNA was XMRV positive. And it was contaminated with an XMRV infected laboratory cell line. They could tell that by doing mitochondrial DNA typing on the sample. And they said that mitochondrial DNA is a mix of the, tumor, the patient's mitochondrial DNA and the cell line mitochondrial DNA. So one of those cell lines that produces XMRV somehow contaminated this RNA sample. And that is where XMRV started, from a contaminated RNA specimen in a laboratory somewhere contaminated with uh, virus from a cell line. It's really easy to contaminate things. You have to be so careful. So that XMRV discovery in prostate tumor was a contamination, as was every subsequent detection of it as well, either from plasmids or contamination of mouse DNA or virus from this XMRV-producing cell line. The conclusion is XMRV is not a naturally acquired human infection. Several years, a number of years, well here we are, September 2012, six years, of false leads and frustrations, and now it's finally resolved. We, to this day, do not know what the etiology of chronic fatigue syndrome is. These patients are, again, left without knowing uh, what has caused their disease. And this continues to be a very important problem to work on, and people are doing so. So what's the moral of this? The moral is that you trust science, 
not scientists. You don't trust any scientist's individual results. You wait until the field has validated a study. And in this case, there were a couple of interesting observations early on, but it wasn't reproducible. And more and more people were finding that, and eventually, with enough laboratories working on this issue, it was figured out that this was a laboratory contamination. Science is self-correcting. If something wrong is published, and it's important enough that people are going to work on it, and in this case, prostate cancer and CFS were important diseases and still are, others worked on it and found that the, that the association of XMRV with these diseases was incorrect. So I think this is a great story to show how science works. It's really instructive to show how you can have a result and eventually show that it's not wrong and that in the meanwhile, if it's an important disease, there's a lot of dissent surrounding it, a lot of contentiousness, a lot of accusation, a lot of strange things happening. But in the end, science is self-correcting. And so this is really cool that this is a virus story that I can tell you that really illustrates this in a beautiful way.